Okay. How about show live by uh, Telstar? No, Syncom. S Y N C O N. <laughs> live through the magic though? No, just live via Syncom or live via satellite. Wow. Holy cow. There's people out there in the audience already. <laughs> da -da 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 Hello everybody and welcome to the first live via satellite coast to coast come time travel with me show. Can everyone hear me okay? If you can say something. I'm looking at what you're all saying. Just gonna stay here and look great for the camera while I look at all the things you're saying. Yes. And there's Raul. Fantastic. Everyone can hear me. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is how it's gonna work. If you have seen my live show at conventions or libraries or the Ruben H. Fleet or anywhere else, then you know how this works. I do a little bit of exposition on what's happening in our current year of 1965. Uh, and then I open it up to questions. So only for the first 10 minutes will I be talking, and then I will be opening up to you, the audience, to go wherever you would like me to go. And today is a very special day. So until just a few years ago, before Telstar, we were limited to just the United States, maybe Canada and Mexico. But now, thanks to satellite, we can actually bring in guests from all over the globe. So we've got Cora Bullock coming in from German West Germany. We've got KD coming in from Australia, and we've got Jason Sachs all the way from the distant state of Washington. That's the state, not the District of Columbia. Um, so to start things off, I see we've got a full crowd in the audience, so I'm going to just launch right into it. It is currently March 27th, 1965, and you're, if you're wondering what this is all about, let me show you. This is Galactic Journey, a portal for you to 55 years ago to where I am today. And we focus on science fiction, the space race, and there's lots of exciting stuff to talk about in the space race today. We got a nice letter the other day. Here's the space race. So Galactic Journey is your portal to the past for you folks out there in 2020 land. And for me, it's where I live. If, uh, if Doctor Who is still around in 55 years, this is what it looked like back then, but I can't imagine this show is going to last much longer. I mean, look how old Billy Hartnell is there. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be off the air in a couple of years when he decides not to renew his contract. But for now, it's a hoot. Of course, we can't watch it in the United States because Syncom doesn't have enough bandwidth to carry all of British television. We barely got Danger Man this year, but we did get Supercar a couple of years ago, and that was great. Um, so someday we may get Doctor Who on this side of the pond, but not currently. And I'll be showing you all kinds of really interesting stuff as the day goes on. But first, I would like to introduce some of our special guests. So our first one up is going to be Kay Doherty. And she is a space historian, um, which is interesting. You wouldn't think we'd have space historians given that the space race is only eight years old at this point, and yet so much has happened, we have to have people documenting it. We've already been through the Mercury program and the Vostok program, so things have already happened, things are already exciting, so it's important to document them. And Kay Doherty is one of the foremost space historians in the world, putting me to shame. And I'm, you know, I'm pretty hot potatoes myself. Um, you know, I'm part of the me fan club. I'm the president and uh, founder. Uh, so she'll be on any moment and she can tell you all about her story. Uh, in the meantime, why don't you enjoy this wonderful hit?
Martha and the Vandella. She brought us dancing in the street last year, and now there's nowhere to run to. That is a brand new song. How many of you are in to the Motown sound? I want to know. Oh, whoops, that's not what I want to know. I want to know that. That's what I want to know. All right, so here we have Kay Doherty. Kay, can we hear you? Can you hear me now? I can hear you just fine, although you sound strange, almost as if you're on the other side of the world. Funny that. Such a long distance from Australia. It is indeed. And uh, we've got the speed of light as a factor, so there may be a very slight shift in uh, time synchronization, or maybe not. Maybe you won't notice it at all. So, Kay, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I am currently a student. I'm studying space physics at the University of Sydney, but I used to be a uh, computer lady at the weapons research establishment at Woomera. What does that mean, a computer lady? <laughs> it means I get to do all the, uh, the grunt work for the um, calculating all the uh, results of all the uh, tests that are carried out at Woomera. So the missile tests, the other weapons tests, and of course the space work as well. Now when you say a computer, you mean you were the actual computer. You did the calculations with your Frieden mechanical calculator or by hand or with slide rule, correct? Pretty much. Although we've actually progressed beyond the Friedens, thank heavens. Uh, we now have the assistance of um, a couple of computers. We have Redac, which is an Australian designed uh, computer, and Agwac, my favorite, which is an analog computer, still operating beautifully. And we've just recently acquired an IBM as well. An IBM, that's, that's like the pinnacle of technology, although I will tell you I am partial to the CDC 6500 series, which has just come out, and it's beautiful. We're talking several thousand characters of memory at a time. Wow. I think it'll be a while, unfortunately, before we see that one here. Our government is not known for um, being lavish in its spending on these kinds of things, which has been good because that's why we still have computer ladies. <laughs> All right. And now I'm going to bring in Cora Bullard. Cora Bullard is a esteemed writer, journalist, and fiction writer from Germany, and she will give us what things are like just on the free world side of the Berlin Wall. So that's gonna be very exciting. Um, but while we're waiting here, um, I wanna tell you a little bit about what's happened in the last week and a half. So those of you in 2020 should know that there is a disease pervading our country at this time. And it has infected virtually every single city. And I'm talking about the insidious disease of segregation. Um, those of you may know that uh, last week was a march that started in Selma uh, and it was black and white people marching together to Montgomery uh, protesting the lack of voting rights. It was a march that wasn't allowed to happen for several days. Um, March 7th was called Bloody Sunday when uh, Sheriff Bull Connor cracked down on the marchers uh, and would not let them leave the city. Uh, President Johnson called it a national tragedy uh, and called for not only uh, the march to go on, but also to ensure that everyone have voting rights. He pushed legislation for what's going to be a comprehensive voting rights act that will pass in a few months, uh, hopefully, given the, uh, the Democratic majority in Congress probably, although as we know, there's plenty of Southern Democrats who may try to gum up the works. Um, so that's one thing that's ex exciting that has happened. Um, they made it to Montgomery on March 25th, and Martin Luther King gave his speech. Uh, here's a bit of what that looked like.
pretty amazing. Um, also, this last week saw some of the most momentous space news of the last two years. As you know, a year, a couple of years ago, Valentina Tereshkova was the last person to orbit the Earth uh, for more than a year. Um, the Soviets rather put us to shame with the end of their Vostok program, orbiting not one but two people, including the first woman and civilian in space, um, making the uh, last day-long flight, Mercury flight of Gordo Cooper, seem a bit punk in comparison. Uh, so for the remaining, the inter intervening year and a half, we've sort of been waiting for the other shoe to drop. What would get at first, the two-person Gemini or whatever the Soviets had planned next? Uh, as it turned out, the Russians beat us in October with Voskhod 1, three people in space at a time. No spacesuits, but three people in space at a time. Um, and then just a couple of weeks, just last week, while Gus Grissom and John Young were getting ready to launch, Voskhod 2 went up and the Russians did the very first spacewalk. Um, that said, just a couple of days ago, Gus Grissom and John Young came back from their Gemini 3 mission, uh, and that worked out just fine. All right, Eric Severide is not available in the booth to comment on the Gemini 3 launch. Uh, but that's all right. I see we have Cora Bullard here. Cora, would you introduce yourself? Well, hello. I'm Cora Bullard. I'm from beautiful Bremen in um, not in West Germany, because as you know, there are two Germanys at the moment, uh, East and West Germany. I'm from the nice democratic free one. Free one. The East Germany is a place uh, where the population is unfortunately locked in by the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain. And well, my beautiful hometown Bremen is turning 1,000 years old this year. Yes, it was founded in 965, not founded, well, it was granted city rights, which is a pretty big deal. Our soccer team is currently at the top of the league, league and um, they may perhaps win the championship, which would be awesome. But, um, well, we'll see. Okay, so what else happened? Well, I was at the cinema. And I watched this really great movie, a Western from Italy. It's called, in a little name, is Il Pu uh, I have to look this up, Per un Pugno di Lari, which translates as For a Fistful of Dollars. It stars an American actor, a funny TV actor, I don't know because we don't get those shows, called Clint Eastwood. And well, it's a really awesome film. It's not available in the US as far as I know, but I hope you get to see it soon. I have a clip of the trailer here, actually. Uh, they sent us a, uh, a, 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 a eight millimeter of it. So uh, hold on one second. <laughs> Terrorherrschaft zweier verfeindeter Sippen in San Miguel. Guten Abend. Wer ist der Mann, wagt einen Ausweg aus dieser unheilvollen Situation zu erzwingen? <lacht> Texas Joe, der Einzelgänger, gespielt von Hollywood Star Clint Eastwood. Suchst du was Bestimmtes? I didn't know Clint Eastwood spoke German. <laughs> well, um, his dubbing voice apparently does. I actually don't know who the actor is, but there are a couple of German actors in the movie, like Marianne Koch, who normally does um, Steppy Romances. Uh, doesn't really fit into a Western at all. And um, some other German actors, but well, it's a great movie. And uh, the Italians apparently can, can do more than just uh, those uh, sweat and sandal epics. Uh, they do all the time. So that's great. Oh yes, what else happened? Well, the Eurovision Song Contest took place um, last week. Don't know if you've heard of it. It's a, it's a Europe-wide, well, Western Europe-wide um, 
music competition where singers and uh, musicians from 18 European countries compete. Germany unfortunately finished last, but um, in the but um, well, the performance was not very good. I like the song, but um, the singer had problems. Uh, I feel really sorry for her. Her our neighbors in Austria finished better. They finished fourth with a very talented young man called Udo Jürgens. He didn't win this time, but I'm sure it will be his year someday. And well, the winner was Luxembourg, which is a bit surprising, with a very young lady, she's only 17 years old, named France Gall, who sang a beautiful, who sang a beautiful song called um, Poupée de Cire, Poupée de Song, which, mean, which translates into Doll of Wax, Doll of Wax. And um, well, it was, the song was written by Serge Gainsbourg, who I don't know, think you know him, but he's a, He's a very talented, up-and-coming French singer and songwriter. Um, I think we actually have a clip of that, don't we? Oh, I will roll it right now. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. <laughs> Cora, you're off, but you look very animated. <laughs> the mic was out. <laughs> out. Uh, I switched it off um, because you need of better. Music. You need better gaffers in Germany. Do you, do you have a union? <laughs> yes, uh, of course. Everything is unionized here. <laughs> oh, fantastic! So, other things we will talk about. Uh, unfortunately, Jason Sachs was supposed to join us from Washington, and I don't see him. But if he, yes, he's here. Uh, but he is not asked to speak, and that's what he needs to do. Um, so, uh, not only do we cover the uh, the news of the day, and that's of course very interesting, but the fact is, we are all. Fans, and as you know, fan is short for fanatic. We are the folks who wear the uh, beanies with the propellers on them. Yeah, it'd, it'd be lucky if we could get any good press in the news, but of course we won't. Uh, the closest that comes to uh, uh, responsible journalism for science fiction is in fact galactic journey. So this is the kind of thing that we cover. As you can see, uh, the, the pinnacle of, of liberal science fiction analog magazine and its, and its cutting edge editor, John W. Campbell Jr. Um, actually, I bring this up because uh, John Schoenherr is the artist for this cover and he does uh, fantastic work in here like uh, this illustration for Dune, uh, which is Frank Herbert's, Frank Herbert's new novel. Um, it's a fantastic book if you like reading encyclopedias and if you like the idea of being inside the head of every single character all the time switching viewpoints every two sentences he said sarcastically um that said it is a fantastic world he has created and i'm enjoying reading it but uh but it can be a slog as my wife can tell you um oh i think jason's coming in but um but the exciting thing about science fiction is we have transitioned so there have been several ages of science fiction they include the golden age uh, even before that there was the pulp age with hugo gernsback and magazines like amazing uh and air wonder stories and, and all the you know uh, uh the shadow all the uh doctor doctor doc savage um that lasted the 20s and 30s and then 
the predecessor of analog called Astounding came about in the late 30s and pretty much defined science fiction from there on out. Um, this idea of technological stories um, that are designed, that they're adult thinking, they're a step beyond just adventure serials. Um, the golden age pretty much was wiped out by World War II and paper shortages. But at the end of World War II and a few years later, um, dawned the Silver Age, and that's when magazines like Fantasy and Science Fiction and Galaxy came into being. And by 1953, there were some 40 magazines coming out every month, and that's where you got your science fiction fix. Um, by the next year alone, people were already, made, already lamenting the death of science fiction. And by the end of the 50s, we were down to six magazines a month. Uh, these days, we're up to about eight. Galactic Journey covers every single one of them, uh, in part thanks because we have so many correspondents in so many different countries. Um, and every year we do what's called the Galactic Stars. And the Galactic Stars is the answer to the Hugos. And those of you who don't know, the Hugo Award is considered the most prestigious award in science fiction. It's, it's like the Oscars of science fiction. Um, Galactic Journey has been nominated several times for this award, and yet not once have we appeared on the 1963 or the 1964 ballot. So I'm, I'm hoping that we appear on the 1965 ballot, um, because this is a travesty that we're told we're going to be on the ballot, and then we aren't. So every year we, we review tons of books, and as you can see, this is just a small sample of the books that we review. Um, and then we tell you which ones are the best. And I'm going to give you the name that you folks need to follow. It's, you probably haven't heard of him. Um, he's obscure even in 1965. Uh, his name is Cordwainer Smith. Um, it's not actually his real name. I happen to know. I got a bit of inside information from his fanzine. His name is Paul Linebarger. Um, he's actually the godson of Sun Yat-sen. Uh, and he was raised in China. Uh, has this incredible knowledge from his Secret Service background, and, and he's just, you read his stuff, and it's like poetry, and it doesn't read like any other science fiction because he has such a unique perspective, and he's got this world called the Instrumentality, which is this far future world that has human beings and a master computer that sort of runs them, and under people who are these slaves, but they're, they're animals, almost Dr. Moreau-like put in the guise of humanity. And he's got all these stories that he's woven this tableau over the last 15 years. If you get a chance, Cordwainer Smith, he just released a book called The Boy Who Bought Old Earth, which is sort of half of a story. The other half is in a magazine called If, called The Store of Heart's Desire. Easily the best thing that came out last year, Cordwainer Smith. So I talked about how we transition into the 50s into something that I call the Silver Age of Science Fiction. By the last year, we were seeing interesting things coming out of, I realized you couldn't see any of that. <laughs> I, was, I was trying to show you our galactic stars and, uh, and now you can see it, <laughs> but you couldn't see it before. This is the galactic stars. I am not a technical person. I was hired for my looks, which tells you just how low the budget was. Um, so anyway, that's the Galactic Stars. Um, but anyway, 1964, the British, they didn't just invade with the Beatles. They invaded with their science fiction and with names like Brian Aldiss and J.G. Ballard. Um, and to some degree, um, people who came from America but essentially adopted the British style, moved to England, like Harry Harrison, have created this moody, philosophical, softer science fiction that we're starting to call the new wave. And it's very exciting to be in this new wave of science fiction because we're just getting all sorts of stories we never got before. I have a suspicion that it's going to bring out stories that appeal to a larger audience. Um, Kurt Vonnegut Jr. is sort of the poster child for the break at, breakthrough between uh, norm mainstream fiction and science fiction. Um, speaking of which, look at that handsome gentleman down there. Uh, Shabbat Shalom, Jason. We uh, Are you looking at pictures of yourself again. <laughs> uh, this is Jason Sachs, possibly the leading authority in the world. Literally wrote the book on comic books. Um, 
It's it's sad that he has a deficiency, however. He prefers national comics to Marvel. But we're going to forgive him tonight. Um, Jason, tell us a little bit about yourself. Nice to see everyone. Um, I'm Jason. I live here in Seattle, rainy Seattle. Uh, Cora mentioned her soccer team. Uh, it's just about opening day here, baseball season, coming up in a week or two. Um, we have a bit of controversy because our beloved Seattle Rainiers are suddenly going to become the Seattle Angels of all things. Um, for reasons more complicated than you need to know about, um, the team has changed ownership and we're not very happy about it. At least they'll keep playing at beautiful Six Stadium down in the south end of town and we'll get to enjoy that. Um, Nice to meet everyone. I've been a comic book fan for uh, more years than I'd like to count. Of course, uh, like many of us who came up in the 1950s as comic readers, I fell in love with um, EC Comics back in the day. Um, and of course, they published some of the greatest science fiction, horror, crime, and war comics that have ever been published. Uh, I've stayed with it. A lot of my friends have moved away and then come back. Uh, I stayed with the industry, and I still love science fiction and comics, and I love comics in general. Um, one of the, the and there's quite a bit of connection between comics and science fiction, among others, the fact that H.P. Uh, Lovecraft's former agent is a DC or national comics editor. Um, now, it's fair to say I love national comics, which include Batman, Superman, The Flash, and Green Lantern, uh, maybe more than Marvel comics. However, Marvel's kind of making me come around. There's a lot of uh, really interesting stuff coming out from Marvel. My uh, piece last month on the radical changes that Marvel is creating in their Avengers comic um, just kind of blew me away. Uh, so imagine you have the Avengers who are the greatest heroes of all, as Gideon was talking about earlier. Imagine Doc Savage, the Shadow, and Operator 49 or whatever he's called, all together in one team. And all of a sudden, they all leave and a new group of heroes takes their place. But not only are they new heroes, they're actually former villains who take their place. It's a weird concept. Um, it's the kind of thing that only a real upstart like Marvel could do. So I can't wait to see how this turns out. Um, and their comics are just getting more and more interesting. So, you know, I'm, uh, I may have to switch rather than fight. We'll see how it goes. I see our traveler has walked away for the He's moment. We may have to carry the show on on our own. <laughs> Actually, I've got a question for you, uh, Jason. We've just started screening in Australia a uh, version, an animated Marvel superheroes cartoon. And the interesting thing is that I'm assuming the animation comes from the US, but it has inserts around it of characters who are pretending to be Marvel-like characters but shot in Sydney. Oh, wow. How so, interesting. Yeah, so I'm wondering, did the original, when they were showing it in the US, actually have live action or narrator type inserts around it? Uh, so the ones I'm thinking of had um, actual shots from the comic and they would shake them up on the screen yeah, to make yeah, the like characters the, like move the, around. Yeah, um, like but they didn't the, have uh, action uh, animation, yeah. Yeah, it, it's wonderful in its own unique way, uh, but they didn't have any characters around that, no. Oh, yeah, no, there must be something they've just done for Australia then, but they've literally huh. had, it's on like five nights a week, so every night you have a different character and they show a whole story for that character in that night. But around it, it starts out with, oh, what was, he's the um, the Master Marvel and Dynamite, his uh, sidekick, and they're live-action characters who actually come in around the, the animation and narrate it. Oh, wow. How interesting. Did not know about that. By the way, I just wanted to show that uh, in my, I, I was running up to get the latest comic, so um, fan of uh, <clears throat> Marvel and Sergeant Fury. But I, thanks to, to Jason, I can say that I do go both ways. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, speaking of which, so now you've seen a, a, a nice cross section of what the journey does. I'd like to find out what everybody out there likes about the journey. What What are your? I, I know many of you tune in every other day when we release an article, so I'm interested to know um, what you like best. Is it the science fiction literature? Is it the movies? Is it the comics? Um, go ahead and don't be shy and tell. And in fact, 
now that we've all introduced ourselves, and this is the most prestigious panel you will ever get in one place live via Syncom on March 27th, 1965 at about 6.30. So because of that, um, I want you, the audience, to tell us what you'd like us to talk about. What are you most interested in? What's going to you, you, you send in your comments and then our lovely moderator will hand the questions over to me and then I will announce it to everybody and we'll talk about what we're going to talk about. And in the meantime, I will do a little dance. Actually, speaking of dancing, we have here oh. <laughs> a oh, very, yeah. very small person. There we go. This is Lorelai. Um, I was realizing we should have prepared some music for today, but one thing that would be fun to do is if we do this show again, and I hope you want us to do it again, um, Lorelai could perhaps do a show. Uh, she has a whole set of music from, from Bob Dylan to Harry Belafonte to Frank Sinatra. Um, there's a music duo. They used to be called Tom and Jerry. Uh, they were they were all in the college circuit for a little while, and they broke up because their their album was a total flop. A uh, couple of launchmen, uh, Paul Simon and Art Carbuncle, or something like that. Anyway, uh, she she's more hip and jive with the lingo of today. Um, but anyway, I understand Paul Simon is doing pretty well on his own in England, and Art Carbuncle Garfunkel um is growing out his hair which is something i'm considering doing in protest of the vietnam war which is heating up by the way are any of you worried about being drafted or do you have kids who might be drafted um because canada is starting to look pretty good right now i mean not for me i'm 39 years old as you know <laughs> but <laughs> and lorelei thankfully is a woman and therefore does not need to enlist but if anyone has any military age sons the draft is a live issue and boy i would not want to be 18 to 21. yeah thankfully my oldest my I only have one son who's a little past the age to go in but i would be terrified otherwise this war looks scary and looks like it's something the u.s is not going to be able to get out of well, we keep doubling down. So I understand we're sending in 3,000 troops. If you go to the Q&A section, I'm marking your questions. Uh, all right. Uh, hold on. The lovely moderator is telling me what we should talk about. Uh, how much do Cold War pressures affect the space race? How much do cold... So the question is, how much do Cold War pressures affect the space race? Uh, the answer is there would be no space race without the Cold War. Um, the only reason we have people in space right now is because the missiles on which we put warheads to blow up Russians uh, happen to be powerful enough to put people on them, too. Uh, now, we had to make the rockets so they wouldn't blow up one in ten times because that's acceptable losses for nuclear warheads, but not for people. Um, but it's, it's very clear that the space race is almost a peaceful substitute for the cold, for, for a live nuclear war. So I'm all for the space race. If we want to wave our, our long cylindrical things in front of each other, I would rather they have people on the end of them rather than radioactivity. Yeah, absolutely. What's our next question? That's... Oh, go ahead. Uh, sorry. Go ahead, Kate. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was just going to say the um, there's a, a theory in anthropology called uh, cultural dynamism. And uh, essentially what we're seeing with the space race now is that the Soviet Union and the United States are expressing their cultural dynamism uh, rather than going to war or colonizing by uh, contesting with each other in uh, in space. This next question is very interesting. Um, we are asked uh, how sci-fi's development uh, works in correlation with space exploration. So this is really interesting. In the golden age, <clears throat> the great unknown was the sky or the planets. And planets were places like Mars and Venus, excuse me, which were, uh, I'm enjoying the taste of rich Sanka decaffeinated coffee. <laughs> um, 
and Mars and Venus were inhabitable places with either weird creatures or people who looked exactly like humans. Uh, by the time we got to the 50s, we started to get our first story set outside the solar system because we knew that space exploration was coming soon. When Sputnik went up in 1957, the character of science fiction changed forever. We decided that close to Earth was too close. Um, we had a short-lived uh, show uh, with Colonel McCauley, Man in Space, um, that took place near the Earth. But for the most part, stories started to take place far beyond our stars. Uh, very interesting, possibly the biggest casualty was Isaac Asimov, uh, who had been a, a, a laureled science fiction author for 20 years, decided to stop writing science fiction. And while you see an occasional story, for the most part, he just writes nonfiction now because science had caught up to what he was doing. Um, we're going to see some more stories with much grander scope because the newspapers have far more interesting and, and tension-filled stories um, than science fiction ever did. Um, so science fiction has to stay one step ahead of the space race. So All I right. will note that uh, there were many uh, sci-fi comic strips in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, we, all, we all know the phrase Buck Rogers sci-fi, and uh, Buck traveled around in his uh, uh, rocket ship, I guess we could call it, through space, um, met uh, a number of crazy alien creatures from bizarre alien worlds, and Flash Gordon followed the same way. In fact, uh, if you read Flash Gordon, you know that art on that strip is beautiful. It's done by a number of people who work inside the comic industry who have long histories in it. But uh, I'd like to say comics led the way to deep space exploration. Well, it's yeah, an well, interesting well, thing, you know, that with uh, a lot of the, uh, going right back to the 20s, there's this real link between science fiction and space pioneers. You know, all the early space pioneers all said they were influenced by people like, you know, Jules Verne and H.G. Wells and so forth. But uh, particularly through the 20s into the 30s, um, a lot of them were reading science fiction, sometimes even writing science fiction, uh, and that in turn was getting more people interested in rocketry. I found a lovely story that... Um, there was a young man in Victoria here in Australia, one of our earliest rocket experimenters, and he actually wrote to um, uh, Amazing Magazine to say that he had been inspired to start experimenting with rockets from reading about um, the stories of space travel in, in Amazing Magazine. This was 1937. Well, all of the German rocket scientists that now work for NASA, people like... Um like um, Werner von Braun and Jesko von Puttkammer and so on, they all were huge fans of the American science fiction magazines. They got astounding and amazing rights through the war. And well, Willie Lai, whom you know, of course, from his articles, he also was born in Germany and um, actually and he wrote um, about uh, rocket experiments in Germany for the American pulps. And when the Nazis told him, stop that, it's the national security, he says, well, screw you, and uh, went to the US. So that's, uh, well, he went, uh, well, he went voluntarily and early. The other guys stayed there alive. There are children <laughs> watching this show, Cora. I don't know what the standards are like in Germany, but please. <laughs> well, at any rate, well, you can say that to Nazis, I think. Uh, and well, so he left, and the other guys, well, left not quite so voluntarily later on. And well, but, um, they were all they were all reading those uh, magazines and were inspired by them. The next question comes from Vanessa, and it's the influence of Doctor Who in televised science fiction and science fiction targeted children, but adopted by adults. So we're talking about children's shows that become family shows. And by the way, before we go there, I'd just like to say this segment brought to you by the smooth taste of Rally cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, let's talk about science fiction on television then. So this has been an interesting and maybe sad year. The last year saw the death of two science fiction anthology shows, the Rod Serling's The Twilight Zone. Uh, I'm told I bear a small resemblance to him, very small, um, and The Outer Limits. Um, and in fact, with Alfred Hitchcock Presents ending at the end of this season, there will be no science fiction anthologies on television. Twilight Zone sort of set the bar high for science fiction on television. Before that, 
Um, it was mostly horror type shows, a Roald Dolls show, Boris Karloff had a show. Um, science fiction for the most part was seen as a kiddie affair, right? So we're talking about shows like Doctor Who, which was designed for children, um, and all the Marionation shows that are Jerry Anderson, Sylvia Anderson show, uh, Supercar and Fireball XL5 and Coming Space Patrol. I, I haven't heard of Thunderbird. Not, Jerry Anderson didn't make Space Patrol. Right, right. I understand, but it is a marionette show uh, yes, with sir, with fantastic, sure. interesting alt outre modern music. Um, but um, it has been recognized that there is a place for science fiction to appeal to all audiences. And I understand there are two shows in the work right now, which will be interesting. So the first one is coming out next season is a show called Lost in Space. And I understand this is a family targeted show about a family that gets lost in space. I have not seen it, but I understand it is designed to appeal to all ages. The other is um, there's a fellow named Gene Roddenberry. Wait, wait. So I have a comment on that. Uh, lost in Space is apparently based on a Dell Comics comic book called Space Family Robinson, which you can find at your local newsstands right now. Um, Jason knows everything. Um, <laughs> So, um, but anyway, Gene Roddenberry is a former cop, now TV producer. He came out with a show that lasted for a year called The Lieutenant, which I watched because it took place at Camp Pendleton, um, which is a Marine base just about 15 miles from my house. Um, good show, um, but it's off the air now because uh, Vietnam is making uh, war dramas not particularly palatable. And I guarantee you will never hear Vietnam mentioned on Gomer Pyle. Um, but apparently Gene Roddenberry tried to sell a pilot called um, Space Journey, no, Star, help me out here, maybe you guys in the trades, no, Star, Star Trek. Um, and that was in the, the first pilot was in the can in February, got rejected this month, but I understand they may be ordering a second pilot. And that is a show that is supposed to be an anthology show, but with a regular cast, sort of like Wagon Train, but to the stars. Um, Wagon Train is a Western, as you all probably know, because Westerns are everywhere. Um, so when that comes out, I think that and Lost in Space will bridge this gap between adults and children. It was a very long-winded answer, but I wanted to make sure everyone understood what the, the scenery of television is uh, on this day. Um, Cora, uh, can you enlighten us on what television, space science well, fiction television is like in Germany? I wish we had some, because... Um Right now, we don't even get the Twilight Zone outer limits. I hope we get them eventually, or Doctor Who. But um, I've heard a rumor that they are making a German science fiction show, also space-based, called, um, I think it's Raum, Raum Patrouille or something, Andromeda, I don't know, some kind of um, Orion. Yes, that's it, Raum Patrouille Orion, Space Patrol Orion. It's probably going to come to our screens. It's apparently really expensive to make, so I hope it will be good. Uh, we will probably see it sometime, well, maybe late this year or probably more likely next year. But otherwise, the only science fictional, remotely science fictional thing we have on TV are the, is the East German Sandmännchen, and I really should have gotten a clip of that, which is a children's puppet show for a good night little Sandman and um, because now our friends in Russia and the Soviet Union are going into space, little Sandman, who is a good communist little Sandman, of course, goes up with the, with the cosmonauts. But that's really the only thing. And um, you can only watch that if you get East German TV, which I don't get because I'm, I'm not close enough to the border. But I really put all my hopes on this. It's free. A good God-fearing free person. <laughs> More questions. First, I'm going to tell, ask Emily asked, will it be Space Cowboys? That's very interesting. When Galaxy Magazine started in 1950, editor H.L. Gold said, one thing that will not happen is we will not have cowboy stories translated into space milieu. Um, we're going to have mature stories. I have a suspicion Star Trek, if it ever gets to the air, um, will deliberately eschew um, those sort of, sort of sophomoric tropes. Um, boy, look at all those $20 words that are coming out of my mouth. You can tell I'm a snob. Um, Rihanna asks, um, does the knowledge of science fiction restrict on what uh, science fiction writers uh, write? Um, it's the science they know. Right. So I would, 
I would argue that most science fiction writers are not scientists. There are a few. Um, so, for instance, Doc Smith is 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 famous for being an, an actual having a a, a doctorate. Um, and there are several people. Who? Doc Smith doctorate. I think it's in chemistry, and he's a um, he's a chemist for. Um, I think he's a company which makes the baking mixes or something. So, well, I don't know how much that qualifies him about to write about space travel. <laughs> Isaac Asimov also has a PhD in chemistry. Um, but there are plenty of science fiction authors who are in their 20s. Uh, I have a good friend named Tom Purdom. And by the way, I, I bring up Tom Purdom's name because, as you know, I run the publishing house Journey Press. Uh, and we will be reprinting his book in June. And it's very good. So I hope you will look for it in June. But anyway, Tom Purdom's in his 20s, uh, and he writes great science fiction. In some ways, being a dilettante, being a, a reasonably educated but not necessarily professional, um, allows you to cast your imagination in a wider net. Um, you can have very technical, what I call hard or nuts and bolts science fiction. Um, but those necessarily are going to be restricted to the near future in scope because you can only predict so far from where we are today. Um, so science fiction writers do not have to necessarily be scientists, um, although you can get some very interesting science. Uh, Fred Hoyle, for instance, um, writes interesting science fiction, and he's a scientist. In fact, um, he's got one of the two competing cosmological theories. His idea is that uh, the universe is, ex is, uh, is steadily creating new matter as it goes. Um, as opposed to Hubble's idea, which was there was some sort of big bang uh, billions of years ago that the universe came out of. Uh, be interested if I had a poll for that, I'd ask which one you subscribe to. All right, uh, next question. Uh, we were asked, will there ever be a public broadcasting channel on TV or radio? There already are. Um, there are local stations. Um, so, for instance, I don't know if you, you tuned into Ralph Gleason's Jazz Casual, uh, which was broadcast out of a few uh, public stations, San Francisco, Boston. Um, that was a fantastic show. It aired once every month or so. Um, and he would get bands together and, and really give you what was up in the world of jazz. Uh, he, he played uh, some bossa nova before that became really big. Um, those of you in other countries, do you ha is public television a significant part of your TV scape? Oh, well, that's good. Sorry, you go on, Cora. No, you go on, Cora. Okay. Well, in Germany, we own, well, in West Germany, we only have public television. The same is the same actually for the East. They also only have public television. We don't have private stations. We used to have just um, one station, which was actually um, a court of co collaboration between different regional stations. But now, um, for the past um, two or three years, we've had um, two stations uh, called, well, ARD, ARD, and, Z, and ZDF, but we just call them the first and the second program. So we don't have we don't have private television, and I'm not sure if we will ever have private television because um, they're very worried about because of our sorry history about um, ideological bias and some and so on. So so right now everything is public television, and also the radio is also just public radio. Okay, you're okay. Very, you're looking very suave, Edwin, with your cigarette. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Australia is an interesting mix. We're sort of halfway between the British system and the American system. So we actually have both public and commercial television stations. The uh, public uh, broadcasting, we call it the ABC, so it's the equivalent of the BBC, is really important in. Um, regional and remote areas. There are still parts of Australia where you don't have television, a lot of parts of Australia where you don't have television yet. And the only radio station they have is the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Commission. Uh, in the cities, we're lucky we get the ABC on television and radio, plus we have two commercial channels and a swag of commercial radio. So two commercial TV channels, and we're about to get a third. It's very, everybody's That's very excited this year. We're about to see the launch of a third commercial channel in Sydney and Melbourne. Be as big a deal as the Dumont Network. Um, <laughs> about the same, actually. 
I uh, just wanted to say, for those of you who are wondering where Galactic Journey was, this is Galactic Journey. Um, you can go there at any time, and we come out with articles again every two days. Um, so Acacia wanted to know uh, what the difference in science fiction is in the various countries. That's an excellent question. We have a lot of correspondence. Um, we cover German science fiction, British science fiction, Soviet science fiction. You can find uh, Margarita Mospanova's article. She is from Leningrad. Um, interestingly, I was reading a fanzine out of England, um, and there were two published articles from 1964. One was on the state of Italian science fiction, and one was on the state of Japanese science fiction. Uh, the Japanese one was very interesting. Japanese science fiction is just starting to take root. Um, and unlike in America, where it was sort of this pariah genre that slowly got respectability, in Japan, it's going the other direction. Respectable, famous writers are dabbling into science fiction themes. Um, and American magazines are just starting to be printed over there. Uh, one thing that was interesting is one of the, uh, the big no uh, science fiction novels that just came out in Japan is about this plague called M80. It's this flu-like plague that uh, infests the earth. Um, and it talks about, you know, this, the, the results of, of baseball games being canceled and trains not running and this sort of distance of, of, the, social, of the social life. Um, I can't imagine that this has much relevance to anyone living in 2020, um, but I found that interesting. Um, so I, uh, Cora has talked about what uh, TV is like. What is uh, German science fiction like? Well, German science fiction, well, I'm talking about West German science fiction now. It's basically a magazine medium because we have these little, um, uh, wait a minute, I'll get one. I have one here. Here, this is an, an issue, not the latest one, of Perry Roden. Odin, which is our foremost science fiction um, series, um, and um, basically pretty much all science fiction is this little um, 30, 68 page magazines, uh, scenes, and um, well, they trend, uh, we have from Perry Roden, which is all original stories written by German writers, um, created by Clark Dalton, who's not really called Clark Dalton, he's a guy called Walter Ernsting, who um, invented a fictional writer called Clark Dalton, because no he was working as a translator and no one wanted to buy his original story. So he, he uh, came up with this American author he supposedly translated and said, okay, I've got this great story by one Clark Dalton and they printed it and, and said, okay, it was me. And uh, well, that's, an, that's a gl glorious space adventure and Perry Roden has just met a new woman, woman called Mori Abro and sparks are flying. I don't know if there will be a future because uh, for them because Perry Roden has been widowed for two years now. And well, we also have um, two anthology series called Utopia and Terra, Utopische Romane, which print a mix of, um, well, um, translated American science fiction, sometimes translated French science fiction, and um, most of the time also original pieces. And um, East Germany uh, has a few science fiction authors, um, Authors, but uh, they also translate a lot of East German, East European science fiction. So I have an aunt who lives in Leipzig in East Germany, and she sometimes sends me books, books, and uh, so I get books from translated books by Polish or or Soviet um, authors. For example, there's a really great Polish author called Stanislav Lem. Lem, I love his books, and I'm always happy when my aunt sends me some of, some of them. Yeah, just to start things up, uh, I know A. Bertram Chandler uh, is from Australia. He was in the Merchant Marine, and he writes interesting sort of nautical stories. Um, David Rome is a science fiction author originally from England. Uh, he's also in his 20s. He's actually composed for The Journey a couple of times. Very nice young man. Um, and he is has moved to Australia. Um, but perhaps uh, Carrie knows a little bit about the science fiction scene in Australia. Got to admit, I don't know David Rome. I do know Bertram Chandler. Um, he's uh, definitely a sea captain, and he lets you know it. <laughs> he, uh, you know, the one one of his books. There's a line. He says, you know, if it's hot and got a hole, he'll stoke it, and that's pretty much Bertram Chandler. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the uh, the Australian scene is again it's a bit of an interesting mix because you know australia has a very small population so we don't um 
don't have a big market, which tends to mean that the, you know, we get all the, the major American magazines, uh, we get the British magazines, but of course they're always several months later than their release in uh, the US or the UK. Uh, interestingly enough, because they come out as ballast in ships. The, uh, or, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, this is actually something that goes back right back into the 30s. Uh, the pulp magazines used to come out to Australia as ballast in ships. And um, that was how the first Australian science fiction fans actually got to know about international science fiction. <laughs> Um, so there's a lot, a lot actually happening at a what you might call a fanzine level. A lot of, um, a lot of writing is actually done in fanzines in Australia because it's just too expensive to produce a uh, a regular magazine. A particularly well known one is is Woomera. It's called Woomera. Started in the fifties, and um, comes out of Melbourne. Has a lot of really interesting science fiction in it. The uh, next question is, and I think Cora should answer it first, and then we can all pitch in. Do you think the Berlin Wall will ever come down? It's only been up for four years, so interesting question. Well, very few things last forever, and I really hope that awful wall and the awful border, because it's not just the one wall in Berlin, because there's all there's a whole border around um, East Germany, and I hope eventually it will come down. But um, I think it will take, well, maybe 25, 30 years. I don't know. But there are always little things because um, ever since last November, people from East Germany who are older than 65, that means they're pensioners and um, they're not, uh, they're allowed to visit relatives in West Germany, which wasn't allowed earlier because the East German state is not very worried about pensioners um, absconding because they just uh, cost money anyway. But um, actually, all the people are coming back. And my aunt from Leipzig, Leipzig, Aunt Metal, she actually visited us um, us earlier this year. And it was great seeing her again because I haven't seen her in a very long time. And so, well, I hope that at least the wall will get a little bit more permeable than it is at the moment. But I think it will be a long time until it comes down. But it won't last forever. Oh, I do hope you're right, Cora. I have a horrible feeling that if the wall comes down, it's only going to be because there's a war over it. So I would much rather hope that you are right and that yeah. it comes down eventually. That's not the way we want it coming. We want it to come down. We want to come it, we want it to come down peacefully and not with, with the war because um, yeah. I think that's something that at least we wouldn't survive. Australia maybe would. On the other hand, I've seen I've read that book called On the Beach and um, I oh, don't think yeah. about that. <laughs> Have you seen the movie? Oh yes, I've seen the movie yeah. too with Eva Gardner and um, Frank Frank Sinatra, Frank Sinatra and so on. Yeah. Really Ava Gardner, exactly. yeah, it's a great movie. But Eva Gardner very famously said that uh, Melbourne was a good place to shoot a movie about the end of the world because <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't impressed with Melbourne. Jason, do you have any thoughts? Sadly, we here in Seattle are profiting from the war effort, or from the Cold War, I should say. Um, I live not far from Boeing, where um, they're building a lot of weapons that we're using. Um, so I have to admit, I have extremely mixed feelings about it. As a simple human being, I hope you're right. I hope the wall comes down shortly without the need for war. On the other hand, I'm very concerned about uh, my friends losing jobs. Uh, too much peace, in a way, is bad for my little economy. Um, so it's a strange predicament to be in. It was Eisenhower who said, beware the military industrial complex. Johnson has been passing bills year after year, cutting defense, um, sort of a peace dividend as uh, as we start to reproach with the, uh, with the Eastern Bloc. We'll see how much that continues with Vietnam. Um, by the way, uh, just a, a fun little break. Um, we... Uh, I'm, a, I'm very musically uh, motivated and uh, always spinning the discs, always listening to the local disc jockeys. If you ever get a chance, you can always tune in to KGJ, that's Galactic Journey Radio, always updated with the latest musical hits. And in fact, in a couple of days, we have a whole shipload of records that are going to be coming in. Um, it's free. It's fun. Uh, the sound quality is amazing. It's FM broadcast, which means it's the highest fidelity you can possibly get. Listen to it on your stereo, um, and uh, you'll have sound almost as good as if you had a diamond needle 
That's how good this music is. Um, and we cut, and it's very deep album cuts, not just the singles you're used to hearing, um, with all the genres. So tune in to KGJ, because I pay for this radio station. Someone might as well enjoy it. Um, all right, our next question is what? So it was asked, do I think the Twilight Zone will make a comeback? Again, the fact that all of the anthology shows have gone off the air right around the same time suggests that, um, like the decline of the Western, although you wouldn't know it, there's still plenty of Westerns on TV, but say the Western in the, in the cinema, um, I think the anthology science fiction show may have that that time may have passed. Uh, that said, if shows like Star Trek are successful, uh, we may see anthology-like shows. Um, certainly, you've got shows like Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. Um, but, Laurel, why don't you tell us a little about Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea? That's one of your favorite movies, right? <laughs> she has to get on her soapbox to talk about it. So... The camera's right here. Just to um, give you an idea, the the other day, me and my me and my dad watch TV every week. Now we on Wednesdays we watch Burke's Law, and on Thursdays we watch Danger Man, Password, and Rocky and Bullwinkle. And I remember we were watching B Burke's Law this week, and uh, and normally afterwards, what comes, Dad? What comes on after uh, Burke's Law normally? Uh, Bonanza. No, that's after uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle. Oh, uh, after Burke's Law? Um, gosh, I don't... Oh, uh, The Virginian. Ah, that's right. So The Virginian normally comes on. Except this time, after the show, there's a black and white show. And, of course, The Virginian's in color, so we were yeah. intrigued. And it starts with um, a group, uh, like some sort of Russian uh, traitor about to be, like... Um, killed for his crimes and then suddenly played by ed asner by the way <laughs> suddenly all the executors are shot and it's this really interesting it's what could this be is it some sort of like mystery anthology show what could it be and then the theme to voyage to the bottom of the sea comes on da, 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 da. and I, I i rushed to turn off the, <laughs> the tv <laughs> Um, uh, I, I, as if I recall correctly, that was one of the few, uh, movie reviews that got either a one or a zero star. It got whatever the lowest you would give was. It, it was, we called it abysmal. The voyage to the bottom <laughs> of this movie. And then of course, because it was so bad, they had to make a TV show out of it. <laughs> so. I, I, I called her in for the one episode where the giant jellyfish was attacking the, the submarine. It was great. Um, all right, we have a couple. Let me just okay. tell you, Voyage is shown in Australia. It's actually shown in Australia. My my brother-in-law works in um, submarine um, maintenance at the uh, government dockyard, and he calls it Voyage to the Bottom of the Bathtub because he figures <laughs> that's about what the special effects are worth. <laughs> a couple more questions, and then we will sign off. So please stay on till the end. I see a couple of people walking out. I understand you have to go to the bathroom. Bladders are, are only so big. That's fine. So we'll be wrapping up soon. Uh, Jimmy Crop asks if we. Uh, Jimmy Crop, by the way, wrote a, let, a wonderful le letter to the journey. Uh, he's twelve years old and yet very precocious for his age. Um, yes, we have a color television, which is pretty much useless because nothing is in color on television right now. There's the Lucy Show. And there's Bonanza, and there's the Virginian, and oh, and this horrible new show, Bewitched. Has anyone seen Bewitched? What a terrible show! No, um, it's one of it. it's one of the three uh, fantastic comedies that has come out recently. It's Bewitched, The Monsters, and the surprisingly excellent Adams Family. Um, there's also My Living Doll, uh, which uh, stars a a wonderful, hilarious Julie Newmar. If you get a chance, My Living Doll is far funnier than it has any right to be. All right, so the last questions, the last question, so there's two questions. So the first question is, um, essentially, will science fiction start to take into account the psychedelic drugs uh, developed by the Merry uh, Pranksters and, and Dr. Leary and so forth? Uh, the answer is I can tell you the science fiction I'm reading right now definitely features more mind-altering drugs than it did in the past. And I think that goes hand-in-hand hand with the current science fiction focus on psychic powers and psionic powers and, and ESP and Sixth Sense and so forth. Um, so anything that 
changes perception of the mind goes well with people who like psionic stories, <clears throat> John W. Campbell Jr. Um, the other question is, uh, how reliable is broadcast television? I assume you mean, how much can we trust Walter Cronkite? I don't think anyone who watched Walter Cronkite talk to us on November 22nd, 1963, taking off his glasses and tearing up when he heard the news that President Kennedy had been killed. I don't think anyone can doubt the veracity, the integrity, um, or the accuracy of his reporting. Um, I think we trust our media. Uh, I think it is true that news is becoming somewhat sensationalized. So for instance, it used to be that TV news was 15 minutes every night. Now every network has got 30 minutes of television every single night. How do you fill up 30 minutes unless you just make the sports section really long or as we're seeing every single night and it's it's probably very different in 2020 but right now you turn on the television and the first thing you hear about is who has died today um in the in the scourge that has infected the world which is of course the vietnam war um and every day in the newspaper or on the evening news you hear about 10 marines or five marines or 20 south vietnamese troops or 100 Viet Cong villagers um, have been killed in vietnam today um, i hope this never-ending litany of, of mortality is over in 55 years and we've got a one world government and everything is, is wonderful perhaps i'm being pollyanna and i'm probably wrong um i just hope I just bob hope dylan's bob still dylan's around i see your picture or your, your album cover to freewheeling back there stand he's talking about going electric and i think it's a terrible idea i can't wait to hear that it should be exciting take any simon and garfunkel songs and then make them electric to make them appeal to the youth because i think i think that's just pandering um before we go i just want to say uh, i talked about how the silver age of science fiction um was this this tremendous flowering from the golden age and we had so many science fiction magazines and so many great stories come out of it it was really the time that women science fiction authors came to the fore in a way they had not before and by the end of the 50s there were some three dozen women writing science fiction at the time you tend not to hear about the women's creators so much and part of that is their own doing because for various reasons um they often publish under pseudonyms or under their initials so you don't often know when it's a woman writing a story but they wrote amazing they're writing amazing things I, I like to say that women write 10 percent of what gets published but 25 percent of what's worth reading one of the things galactic journey did is we put together a book of 14 of the best stories that came out in the first five years of galactic journey um, and it's this handsome volume rediscovery science fiction by women 1958 to 1963. I know some of you have purchased it. Cora Bullitt wrote one of the introductions for it. Um, it's in 300 bookstores around the country right now. Um, it's an amazing book. Buy a copy, buy several copies, buy some for your friends. It's very important, um, not only because you will love it, but also because um, in a couple of days, my first science fiction novel is gonna come out. And believe me, I will tell all of you about it when that happens. Uh, in just a few days and you will love it um but before that comes out the only book of mine you can buy is this one and it's really really good so buy it now read it over the weekend and then your palate will be cleansed to read my book um and all of you who know where to get it if you've already gotten it or if you're getting it right now tell all your friends um this is amazing science fiction stuff people should know about i hope that in 55 years these names have not been forgotten rosel george brown zena henderson otis kidwell berger catherine mclean judith merrill jane rice but it's possible and the only way we will keep these names alive is if we distribute this book as far and wide as possible so buy copies tell your library to buy copies make it a thing all right i think that's about all the time we have today so i'd like to get a final comment from our guests uh, and then we will sign off. Um, so go ahead, Kay. Oh, I think it's been a really interesting show. Uh, it's fantastic that um, I get to hear from uh, science fiction fans in other parts of the world, especially uh, Cora's German perspective. And I hope I've been able to bring a little bit of an Australian perspective as well, because we here down under often feel like we're a bit forgotten by those of you up in the uh, Northern Hemisphere. 
Cora? Well, thank you for a wonderful show and for the opportunity to take part, even though it's in the middle of the night here. But um, so I'm really glad, glad that I was able to take part and also thankful to the wonders of Telstar and the other satellites up there, which make it possible. And um, I hope to talk to all of you, so you again soon. Jason? I have to say a lot of similar stuff. Uh, it was a pleasure to get to speak to people in Australia and West Germany. I, I, it's inconceivably far around the world, and it's amazing to see you in uh, near real time. That's uh, incredible. It's like I'm talking to someone in California. Um, thanks for uh, having me be part of Galactic Journey. It's one of my favorite projects I get to work on, and I just think it's a wonderful place to share our passions. I have to ask those of you who are in the audience, go ahead and raise your hand or otherwise let us know. Would you like us to do this again uh, in a month or two when the scene has changed dramatically or perhaps we can pick a specific topic? Does that interest you? Also, how many of you would like and would tune in to a special performance by Lorelei uh, on guitar and ukulele and perhaps I'll join her in a duet? Um, if that sounds interesting, uh, then we'll do it. Um, all right, it seems like we have some interest from the audience. Um, so when we sign off today, there will be a kinescope done of this recording. Everyone who watched it will be able to watch it again. You can also send it to your friends. So everyone who missed this can watch it as if it's live. Although, as you know, kinescope is not quite as good quality. Um, but you know, it shows have to cross countries and, and so forth. You've seen the quality. It's good enough to watch. The audio should be good. Um, so we will keep doing this. And this was a lot of fun, and I look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Kate, Cora, and Jason. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.